What's going on guys? Welcome back to Germs Workshop. So today we're going to show you the best way ever to seal the front and back of an intake. That's right. Okay, so I screwed up. Believe it or not. We uh, were putting this sensor in. This is for the fan. So that the uh, fan will come on at 195 degrees water temp. So I, I messed up. This here is the old plug that was in this spot. Um, when I was installing the sensor, I was going by depth, not by feel. So when it kept, it, I looked at it and I was like, hey, you know, this isn't deep enough compared to where the old plug and the bushing were. So I kept cranking on it, cranking on it, and finally it popped. Well, well it cracked the intake. So fortunately, we have uh, a friend, Corey Conyers, over at Crown Customs, and he was able to weld that back up. Now this intake, I was amazed because Corey had to heat this thing forever. This is a huge aluminum heat sink. This thing just soaked up the heat, soaked up the heat, and he did an amazing job getting that welded back up. And we got the, the sensor back in there, and we've got a special guest coming over today that's going to show you guys the best way to seal up an intake. I built a few motors in my day, and I've always struggled with these stupid cork gaskets and whatever they are. The cork ones, rubber ones, it doesn't matter. It seems like they all leak. And then you get oil all over the place in your uh, engine bay from the front, from the back. And uh, it just it causes a mess. It's a pain. So like I said, uh, we got somebody coming over, very special guest, to help us out. So we... Went to O'Reilly's, got the uh, Felpro 1206, which includes, like I said, includes the cork gaskets, but we're not going to be using those. So that's a little secret, cat out of the bag there. Uh, we're going to do something a little different. We got some Permatex uh, 82180 Ultra Black uh, Silicone, and uh, we're going to prep this. All right, guys, also part of the prep... Uh, I'm going to use this 3M Rolock bristle disc. These things are amazing. I've seen uh, friends of mine, family members use them in the professional shops and they will take off darn near anything. If you've got old stubborn gaskets, you've got RTV, whatever the case may be, these things are incredible. Um, they're very durable. You don't. I've I've had this one for a long time, and granted, I don't use it every day, but it it stands up to all the wear and tear that you're going to do spinning this thing across whatever surface you're on. That's the other thing. Whether it's aluminum heads or a steel block or whatever, these things are very soft on the material that you don't want to hurt, but they're very damaging on the material that you do want to remove. You're not going to take off a bunch of material on your heads or anything like that. Um, they're amazing. They're not incredibly expensive. Um, I'll put the price in there. But I, I think uh, I want to say they're like 7 or 8 bucks for one of these. And then the Arbor's like, the Arbor's a little more. It's about $23. But I got mine at the big tool store over in Derby. And uh, they're just, they're incredible. I can't say enough about them. So... Go to your uh, local tool store or whatever, or check them out online. 3M Roll Lock Bristle Disc. And there's three different colors. There's, this is the green one, and it's the one I see most commonly used. But there's also a yellow one and a white one. And I think they just have uh, different, that they're harder. The bristles are more stiff or something like that. So um, do a little research, figure out which one works the best for you, and pick one up today. All right, guys, so I told you about that roll lock bristle disc. So I peeled the part of the old uh, RTV off with my gasket scraper. 
Um, I personally, these were a gift, prefer the uh, Snap-on CSA14C uh, gasket scraper. These things are awesome. They're like super sharp right from uh, the factory for the manufacturer and they do an amazing job of scraping off the gasket. This one I just barely worked at it and it came right off. This one was a little bit more stubborn which speaks to the method that was previously used on this. Um, so it stuck really well, it sealed up good. But I'm going to show you right now how this uh, bristle disc removes this material. It's just incredible. Uh, I'll make sure I move my Pepsi out of the way so that uh, doesn't get silicone in it. Here we go. How amazing is that I mean that thing is clean enough you could probably eat off of it so go get your nachos boys and then go pick up one of these 3m roll lock bristle discs all right guys so one thing that's absolutely critical is since this motor is already in the car obviously and it's already mostly assembled other than the intake we do not want to get anything down in that lifter valley. So I put a t-shirt in there and it's going to protect our lifters and all the oil galleys and all that from any kind of debris from taking these old intake gaskets off. And uh, we want to make sure that nothing gets down in there. So once we're done with the prep and removing all of the old gasket material, we'll carefully take out that old t-shirt and uh, and get everything out and then we'll do one final inspection make sure that there's no other particles or anything that could get in there and cause damage to the lifters or get in the oil system or anything like that now these gaskets they should just pretty much come off in one piece with very little if any trouble and I'm just being super careful I don't want to tear it I just want it to lift off okay these are the same gaskets on here the 1206 that we're gonna put back on so If you just take your time, be patient, this all should come off pretty much with no problem. I don't want to jinx myself, but I may just have done that. Take your time. Probably, probably should have put something down those intake runners too. Just a, a rag or something like that. But I know a guy once did that. Ended up sucking a rag through the intake and bent a valve. So if you do put rags or anything in your intake ports to keep other debris out of there, make sure that your rag doesn't become part of the debris. Cause you more problems.
Okay, there we go. Both the intake gaskets off. Those should clean up pretty good. So, one other thing, in the front and the back of the block, we put these four holes in here so that it would help to uh, help this silicone to go down in there and have a place to stick. Because that's a big part of the problem with these front and rear seals is they tend to push out. Um, so I'm going to make sure well, I'll, I'll get the calipers and double check that hole size. But we'll make sure that those holes are clear. That way the, uh, the new silicone, new RTV uh, Ultra Black will go in those holes and, and be able to do what it's supposed to do. If I'm on this side and keeping the front edge in contact so that any particles as small as they might be are going to go out this way. Same thing over here. The back of the DA I'm going to keep the pad on contact here so that any particles are going to go out this way. <laughs> So that surface is prepped. Now we will carefully remove all of our rags and everything and get ready for the next step. Alright, so we removed the rags from the intake runners. We removed the t-shirt from the valley and now we're going to make sure we did a, a nice visual inspection to make sure that uh, there's nothing else in there that's going to get in our oil system, and now we're going to start putting the intake on. Well, the gaskets. The first thing you want to tell people is that you want to take your gasket before you put any silicone or anything or any kind of a sealer on it, and make sure that everything lines up. You want to make sure that your gaskets cover everything. Right. And I think the last time before we put this motor together, this these heads were gasket matched to the 1206 intake right. gaskets they are and everything lines up fine so we'll just start by putting the um the
And when you have a block that's got these, the, the holes in it, mm -hmm. you want to fill the holes so that it attach, because that's why it's called form a gasket. Right. Um, basically, where I start is always just. I fill in the hole. Now, is this a method that you came up with on your own, or did you learn this from Smoky Eunuch? Or <laughs> this was just mine. This is this, this always seemed to work. If you had to guess, how many motors do you think you put together? Now is it would you do it like this when you guys were doing light model motors too? Yes. Very same thing. Very same thing. So you're just running a bead along there and kind of letting it build up? Mm-hmm. And then do you slap the intake on immediately or do you let no. this kind of cure for a little bit or I always let this set for 15 20 minutes and then i set the intake down on it and then i'll show you that when we set the intake on i want to Now, like I said before, we're not using that cork gasket that comes with the Felpro kit. Nope. Felpro's been around a lot of years and they make wonderful gaskets. But this seems to be the best way I've ever seen to do an intake gasket. Well, it's, it's not the only way, but it is definitely one that's worked for me over the years. And I'm kind of of the thought that if you got something that works, why change it? Sure. That looks like a pretty solid bead. You basically want to just try to keep that as uniform as you can. Mm -hmm. Overkill doesn't hurt anything because that's the nature of, of a, a gasket like this, a, a build a gasket, mm -hmm. is that whatever squeeze on the inside will just stay attached. You notice when we had, when I took my pocket knife, I had to cut that with my pocket knife to get it just to come loose. And so anything that goes on the inside, it ain't going anywhere. Sure. Okay, so we'll just let that sit for a little we'll bit. We'll let that sit. I'm going to set the gaskets down inside so that if you noticed, I put sealant up around the edges. Right. That's typically where you get leaks. Plus, this will set up in the edge of the gasket and hold it in place. Well, this is what I like to do right here. I just like to take this and fill that corner in. Mm -hmm. When you fill that corner in, a lot of times the seal will work here, but it'll leak through the corners. Okay. Like I said, it's probably not the only way, but but it's what it's, we know that works. It's always worked for me, and Now again, this is just a standard four, uh, 400 small block Chevy. It's nothing fancy other than it's got aluminum heads on it. And uh, now these, notice these heads, some of them had steam ports, right? In the middle. 
And these don't have that, so you don't have to worry about anything there. No, if I was going to put this engine on in a, a dirt track car where it's going to run duration, I would definitely want to put ports. Mm -hmm. Circulate circulate the water around those Siamese cylinders mm -hmm. so that uh, that you don't bake the rings in them. Yeah, because that seems to be the fatal flaw with the 400 is the yep. Siamese cylinders. And we've had trouble before with this motor with head gaskets. And that's why I'm kind of leaning away from this eventually and we'll we'll go to an LS motor and I know some of you uh, purists out there will scoff at that but uh, it's what I think is going to be best for the future I mean it's going to be uh, just these LS motors the technology out there is so incredible and so easy to make horsepower with those things especially if you start putting power adders like turbos and superchargers and things like that the bottom ends on those things are so strong yeah. well, the thing that I've heard about come on sweetheart stay right there will ya do you want to run a couple bolts in there just to let it sit or no, because if you know, you know, I wish they would make a sleeve that you could actually, that would stick in the bolt hole that would be the size of the gasket. Mm -hmm. Because the bolt, the bolt holes in the manifold are also large. Sure. And when you've only got, you've only got this much meat between the runners. Yeah. You don't have a lot of forgiveness there. In a stock motor, you'd have a quarter of an inch there and wouldn't really matter if the gasket moved. Mm -hmm. So we just sit and wait then, right? Yeah, I just wait a little bit. Uh, um, if it was 100 degrees out, I would be in a little more hurry. When you, there's nothing really to hold them. Yeah, those cork gaskets. Well, and I've seen them split too. And that's one thing good about the silicone sealers. They don't, with age, they don't, they just stay the same. They don't move, <clears> they don't <throat> shrink or swell or nothing, huh? And, and with the aluminum stuff, uh, aluminum moves. Mm hmm. And uh, it just seems to be the best, and and uh, I've definitely put them through the test with with the late model engines. And well, and especially when you've got aluminum heads and aluminum intake sitting on top of a steel block, there's so much change in in size and shape in in the dissimilar metals. It's just you take take a late model engine that's out there running around. It, 7,500 to 8,000 RPM for 20-minute solid, and temperatures vary. We we run as high as 260 and keep running. Holy smokes! Um, things are moving. And those are still liquid cooled, or those yeah. solid blocks? Yeah, that's that's liquid cooled. So it's uh, and they'll take it. So, hmm. but that's not a a stock block, right? No, 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 we, you would start with, uh, of course, aftermarket makes a lot of blocks, but the Marine, the GM Marine engine is a, is a much meatier block. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, the weak part is crankshafts. Yeah. Um, and it's not necessarily that the crankshaft is weak in a, in a small block engine like this one. It's, uh, it's the webbing. The webbing moves in it, mm. and the the like you said the dissimilar metals. You got the cast block, and you got a billet steel crankshaft. That there's not much give in that crankshaft, and when you start allowing, you start allowing the webbing to move. 
and that's what the LS motors got over it. If you pop them upside down and look at them, there's just no comparison. Mm -hmm. The meat that's in the block of an LS motor, and that's why you can put so much horsepower to it. Yeah. And I'm, you know, there's a lot of advances in oiling systems and. When you, when you set the intake in, it's really critical at this moment, when you set the intake, is that you set it down squarely all at once. Mm -hmm. Because if you set one end down, it'll pinch and push and crease mm -hmm. the silicone, and then sometimes you can lose a seal. And sure. I'm just going to set it down on there and just let it set and then we can start the bolts. But initially when you set the intake on you should be able to look along the edges and you'll see the silicone squishing out. pushing out to the edge. Mm -hmm. So I say it's critical at this point that you get yourself set where you can handle it and you hold the intake nice and square, line it up over your bolt holes and set it down square like like that. Okay. And of course we're looking in making sure the gasket hasn't slipped anywhere. Mm -hmm. It works really, really pretty good. Can't see in here though. I like that. Okay. So we can go ahead and start our bolts. We now. can start our bolts. Just put them down, get them down finger tight. You're using the big flat washers in the center bolts. Yeah, I believe so. But there's only two of them. Believe it or not, I never torqued. I never torqued the intake on the, the race motors. Hmm. Just go by feel. Yeah. Everything looking good there. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever had intake bolts go in so nice. Pretty nice. See it fill that in? Mm-hmm. Must have did something halfway. Yep. And now you can you can let it sit. You could let it sit for probably another 15 minutes or so before you start snugging. The silicone, obviously it's cooler out here than it would be in the shop, but, or you can take it down. It's, I'm pretty sure you, it would be fine either way. Okay. Just start, to, just start taking stuff down to where it's snugging up. Now do you, as far as like a pattern goes, do you start on the inside? Yes, I on start the on the inside? inside. So like you would a head. Yeah, I go click, 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 
click, click, click, click, click, click, click, click. Okay. Click. This way, uh, over time, aluminum tends to pit, mm -hmm. and if you get any pitting, this will seal it. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like when you push the silicone down in the the little pin holes that that, that were made to hold the gasket on there, mm -hmm. uh, any any on the oven, it'll just push up in and form. You let it set up a little bit. And it kind of does the same thing as that the rubber gasket or the cork. And that is, it's oversized, and when it sets up, then you can compress it, and it'll just fill in everything. Sure. So, so there's less squeeze out and more fill in. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, there's, there's several things that go on, especially with a high-performance motor. When you start decking the blocks and you start ma machining the heads, uh, you're changing the geometry in here. Mm -hmm. And so when you do that, you could wind up with a wider gap uh, on the valley than the gasket will cover. Mm -hmm. And, or you could also wind up with an uneven or a tighter gap, and in which case it would pinch and break the gasket. Where the silicone, if, it's, if it takes it right down to where there's just a little tiny film of gasket sealed on one side, and this much on the other side, it, it'll just fill it and be fine. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if uh, anybody's ever really experienced uh, an actual gasket runner leak on one of the runners mm -hmm. because of uneven. I don't know. Well, even if you did, how would you tell? I mean, well, you're going to have vacuum at a place run, where... It would, it, it would lean a motor out or suck oil into it. Mm -hmm. or, um, oh, okay, from the valley. But, yeah. like, between the two runners, you you probably wouldn't even notice that, would you? Um, not really. Not, especially on this engine where you've got just a single plane and, you know, your runners actually run together. Mm -hmm. um, I had an experience one time with, uh, with one of our engines where I had a Team G manifold and uh, right in here um, it had been hogged out to the point where it actually broke. It, it hogged it out on the inside and cleaned it, just hogged it, there was just not anything there. Mm and it actually cracked open. But what was happening is, sitting here running, it was fine. You get it out on the racetrack and start pulling the RPM out of it and it would start doing, it would spit, kind of sputter. Hmm. It, well, it was running lean because it was pulling air. Well, right. what, hap what happened is, is it, it had broke a, a, about a, almost a quarter size split and when you get get after it really hard it would suck that down oh, wow. and just have an open port of air going in and it would lean a cylinder down and kill the cylinder but it wouldn't do it till it was really hot and typically after the after we'd run about 20 laps or so really hard then all of a sudden it would start losing power hmm. and uh, but it about drove me crazy. It took me about three different shots of just really going over it. And I basically caught it by accident at yeah. the shop. I had the light setting just right. And I reached in and grabbed the throttle. And when I did, I thought I seen a reflection come off of the intake. I was looking at it. And I tried it again. And I, I seen it again. And I got to feeling around. And I pushed on it. And it just... 
Wow. Oh, love you, dog. God. <laughs> so we fixed it. So you welded it up? Was it an aluminum intake? Yeah. Epoxy. Yeah, I mentioned earlier, uh, Corey Conyers from Crown Customs, he tagged this one up and holy smokes, there's so much aluminum in this intake. It's like a giant heat sink. He had to put the torch on it for quite a while just to get it to take the weld. So these bolts are 12 point bolts and, a, and a, they're ARP bolts so they're nice strong bolts and mm -hmm. and I just I I worked in airplanes for a few years and that's what I'm used to is the 12 point bolts I like the the tightening power you don't ever have to worry about rounding off a bolt head with a 12 point bolt so they that's what I prefer and that's what we ordered ARP is another good company. It's been around for a lot yep. of years. No more stuff. We can take those breeders off if they're in the I'm way. okay. Yeah. That way I want to drop my wrench down in there. Yeah, that would not be good. But with those stud girls and everything, they wouldn't wouldn't probably go too far. Nah. They wouldn't find their way down the bottom. Now, if you dropped it in the distributor hole, that'd be a different that'd thing. That'd be a different story. I don't think I'll try to do that. Now, if... Uh, now, if you look down in there, we should have a little bit more... I don't know why I use this flashlight. Why don't you put it in your other pocket? <laughs> oh, see? Yep. That's nice. Just pooching her out just like I want. And if you look back there, yeah. you should be able to see it pooching out around the edges. Yeah, there's a nice even bead coming around yep. everything. I'm going to set like that for a little bit and then we'll do that same thing again. And and then, of course, once you light it and let it get up to temperature, and you want to do that one more time. Okay. That's about all it takes. Nothing super complicated, it's just the process, mm -hmm. you know? It's, it's, one of those, it's one of those deals where you, you take so much time assembling a motor. And when you're putting the rotating assembly together, you can't afford to miss. You make sure you got every rod nut and every main and every, you want to make sure you got it on the money. You, you want your torque right. You want to do the sequence right. You want to have it right. And you do all that. And then you put the cylinder heads on it and you want to do all that right. And a lot of times what happens with a guy, well, it's just the intake. And, uh, and they just throw it on there. And then the motor runs like junk, and you know what happened? Mm -hmm. Well, just a little, just a few extra moments to make sure of these few things. Of course, you don't want an oil leak on your motor. Sure. But if the gasket slips and you don't catch it, yeah. Well, the danger part of that is it normally won't slip in the rear. It'll slip in the. It'll slip far enough in the center, but. I actually had one where I missed one time, and since you got coolant, it slipped and filled the crankcase full of coolant. Oh no! Not on one of my race motors; it was on just a regular car motor, mm. and uh, kept filling up with antifreeze. And thinking, where the heck is this antifreeze going? I put like three gallon in this car, and it still was down. And I went, "Where is this going?" And at dawn, I thought, "Oh wait a minute!" I pulled the dipstick out. And you know, like shake. so I didn't even run it. I mean, we strained it, and, but no, didn't no harm. But um, yeah, 
just little things that you run into. And... Hmm. This is a good old motor. Yeah. When I built that motor, I, I can't remember. It wasn't, a, I used to call them hand grenade motors because they were, I, I, I built a few hand grenade motors for my own racing stuff, just bits and pieces left over from several motors that had gone south and two pistons out of this one and six out of this one and crank out of that one and the block out of that one and heads off of that one and you got all that stuff laying around and you start looking and say, hey, I got enough here to put a motor together. And you put a motor together, you call it a hand grenade motor. Yeah. And some of those run as good as any of them. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like you said, it's a lot of it's in the attention to detail in the assembly yeah, process. Yeah, you know, I, I don't want to climb. I mean, there's there's engine builders out there that just simply, I mean, they're just, they're just a class far and above. I mean, their their knowledge and and uh, it's just I love listening to those guys. You know, mm -hmm. and, you know those are the kind of guys that take a broken motor and go, "This is what happened to this motor." Mm -hmm. Where the average guy takes a broke motor apart and shrugs his shoulders because to take take a motor that grenaded it. 8,500 RPM and figure out where this all started. That's why those guys build motors that stay together because they figure out what caused it. Mm -hmm. And I, on the other hand, had been, I have to depend on the machine guy to do his job. My, my assembly is I don't, when I'm putting them together, I don't just check one or two bearings. I check every bearing. Mm -hmm. And uh, critical stuff like you're building a $15,000 motor and you use an old set of rod bolts. Hmm. Why would you do that? You can buy a brand new set of rod bolts for 60 bucks. So you jeopardize $15,000 worth of motor for 60 bucks. Yeah, that's cheap insurance. And, and that, that's just crazy. I never did that. I never put a motor, I never took the rod bolts out of one motor and put them in another. I always took new rod bolts. Mm -hmm. You know, but, and maybe I'm dumb. Maybe the, some of them guys do it. And of course, it's like everything. One guy gets away with it, and that guy, it just doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a reason why manufacturers tell you some of the things they tell you. And uh, one of them is when they tell you to torque a rod boat at 55, you don't torque it at 60, you torque it at 55. Mm -hmm. And uh, they they got that figured out, and I believe them. Yeah. And uh, but there's so much I don't know about stuff. I just I've been probably more lucky than I was good. Hmm. Blessed. And uh, you you know then I I of course I've been unlucky too that that last late model motor that that was the last one I built was the one that was in Jed's car and uh, you know that motor run and just oh that was a potent engine and we decided they were going to run the falls up at 81 and they were going to pay pretty good money in and we had as good a chance anyway we'd won seven features with that that year so it was starting to puff out the breathers a little bit and, I decided to take it down, freshen it up. I put new bearings and new rings, and we cleaned the valves up and actually checked the, the height of some valves and decided to put new valves in it and ordered new manly valves and, and uh, had the, had a head pop off on a valve so hmm. Just like you took the hacksaw and cut it off. Wow. And it just it destroyed that motor in hot laps. You know, of course, looking back, you think, I should have just left that alone. I mean, so what? It's got a little blow by. Yeah. Ain't gonna hurt it. And then I got a piece of junk. Yeah. But I don't know that I live and learn. I mean, I'll probably do the same thing next time. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, you gotta trust the manufacturers. There's probably yeah. one one that just had a flaw in it. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, they tried to tell me, oh yeah, you, you floated the bells and caught a piston. And I said, well, I don't really think so. And uh, it's hard to explain because the stem was still in the head, still attached, and it would still go up and down. And if it hit a piston hard enough to break the, the head off of the valve, you would think it would have bent it, in, but it didn't. Yeah. We took the keepers off and pulled it out and rolled it across the, the, the bench, and it wasn't even bent. It mm. just, and it was just like a clean break, like I don't know what happened to it. Mm. Yeah, and you got a 208 valve and 7,000 RPM, and it's bouncing around inside the cylinder. It doesn't, motor doesn't like that. Yeah. Were those titanium valves or stainless? No, just stainless, or? manly stainless. I mean, the, that that's manly, that's good stuff. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, that's what was in it before that happened, mm -hmm. you know. And that old engine had really taken some abuse. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but like you said, the, the new LS motors, Man, they'll they'll take the RPMs. They'll take the horsepower. It's, yeah. Somebody knew what they were doing when they when they designed that one. Mm -hmm. Lots of research and development. But you know, it's hard for me to get past this motor that's right here. Mm -hmm. these, these motors were just, of course, that's what I built. Sure. I'm not putting a tremendous amount of pressure on these. Sure. And I don't know whether if you wanted to put a torque wrench on them when I was done and go what they might be torqued at. And when you go the second round, mm -hmm. It's not near as critical, the sequence. Okay. Because you pretty much have already taken all this, any slack that is in there. And it's nice that you're not going to start just and run it right away. Yeah. It, uh, You'll have plenty of time to cure. That silicone will set up nice and it'll look just like the other one. Boy, that last one. I don't think we hardly. Silicone probably wasn't even dry when we set it in the motor and fired her up, right? <laughs> Um, well, the good thing is there's no pressure there. Yeah. It's only splash, so so it's not like uh, not like you're uh, putting stress on it. It's just not. Feels pretty good. Feels pretty good. See how tight I got. It's pretty tight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably tighter than I want to go home, <laughs> but that's all right. Now, once, like, say, once you they cure you. Put it back together, you fire it up, you get it, bring it up the temperature, shut it off, let it set. 
as it's cooling down, just tweak them a little bit. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to tell if one of them's a little loose, just pull it up to where about that snug. And okay. Alrighty. Well, thanks a bunch. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, like I said before, we got a 180 thermostat that we're going to run in here. And then this will open at 180. And so if you're running down the road, it'll keep the motor cool, be fine. But if you get a stoplight or in traffic or something like that, the 195 sensor will turn the fan on and help to cool the motor the rest of the way.
Okay guys, so we showed you today how to prep the intake. We showed you a couple of really cool tools that we can use. Showed you how to prep the uh, valley, the intake valley, and make sure that that was all clean of debris. And then, in my opinion, the best way to seal up the front and the back of the intake, obviously using a gasket on the sides, uh, this is specific to small block Chevrolet, but I'm sure um, I'm not super familiar with the Fords and the Dodges and stuff, but uh, the application of the silicone um, on the front and back of the intake could be used in any various number of uh, applications. So keep that in mind. Uh, this motor's pretty much ready to fire off. We've got a little bit more wiring to go. A um, couple more things to check out. Other than that, um, as always, thank you for joining us in Germ's workshop. Um, literally out in the workshop working on the Chevelle today. And uh, special guest, my father-in-law. He's a great guy. He's got lots of knowledge and experience. Um, thank you, Doug, for coming over and helping us today. We really appreciate it. Appreciate the time we get to spend with you um, and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, if this vi video was helpful for you today, uh, go ahead and like, share, and subscribe. Comment below if you've got any tips or tricks uh, that you like to use on your intake installations. Um, and as always, remember, 10 in, 10 out.